Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming along. And uh, it's as you can see, we don't get a very big audience for this kind of thing among roboticists. We get some, but for, well, there's quite a reluctance for roboticists to engage with these issues, which is a bit of a shame. Sometimes we get more, but, but not often. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about uh, quite a dramatic title, but it's aimed at roboticists. Do we want our robots killing and maiming in our name? Just struggling with the technology here. I'll just use this. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at some of the challenges. Uh, technological compliance with IHL, that's international humanitarian law. Look at some of the ethical issues, which George has covered really well, I think. And uh, some of the international security issues. And then look at the way forward. Uh, now, quite a lot has happened since we, uh, in recent times, and there's quite a lot of detail now in working out with the military and the political sphere as to what the way forward is. But I've kind of left that uh, after my conclusions in case I've got time, because today, really, I just want to get across what the issues are rather than anything else uh, to, to you guys. Okay. So, um, so what we used to have was direct control of weapons, where somebody pulls the trigger and the weapon fires directly like that. But nowadays, most modern weapons have some sort of computer chip or some sort of computer intermediating between the person pressing the trigger and the weapon firing. So computer control. And as George has, has nicely shown us, uh, we've got remote control weapons, which have been around since, uh, these, have been, these drones have been around since 19, 12 actually surprisingly but the armed ones like this have been around since 2001 when the CIA first armed them and you can see see one here uh, this is pretty edited actually it's not really like this okay. so I have a number of issues with with the drone warfare but I'm not going to talk about that today most of my issues are concerned with their use by the CIA which to me seems insane um, and, uh, there's a lot of talk uh, that George has just talked about, about ethical buffers and stuff, but I, I'm not going to cover that. There's, there's mixed views on that. Um, so what I'm interested in, we've, we've got this far with the weapons, and there's something like 85 countries now that I've tra personally tracked that have these. Um, so what I'm interested in is, is this idea that these are flown from 7,000 miles away from the action, and George just showed us a video of that. Um, but the next step is what I'm going to be focusing on, and that's when we take these guys out all together and we have the machines flying on their own. Now, I want to be very clear here what I mean by an autonomous weapon system. That's what I'm talking about, and as George mentioned, I'm part of a campaign to stop killer robots. Uh, it wasn't a title I wanted at the time because I call them fully autonomous, I call them autonomous weapon systems, but nonetheless uh, the NGOs I'm working with convinced me that was a good title. So, an autonomous weapon, right, what is it? Well, what happens is as soon as you pull the lever or press the button, it's a weapon that is completely under computer control. There's no further intervention. That's a fully autonomous weapon, not a semi-autonomous. Okay. Now, as you know, um, this relies on information coming in from sensors. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. You're all aware of that, being roboticists. The information comes in from sensors, get proce gets processed, and information goes out to actuators such as motors. Now, I want to be very, very clear here that our campaign has nothing to do with this part of it. You can be as autonomous as you like in any function you like, except for one, and that's the kill decision. So all we're against is the kill decision being automated. Simple as that. I mean, there's a lot of other problems, but the campaign I'm working on is simply that, stop that kill decision. It's not difficult to understand that. There's so many talks being given on this, going through different levels of autonomy and all that kind of thing. It's kind of irrelevant to me. All I'm concerned about is, is that kill decision automated or not? Okay. Meet the X-47B, the technological dream machine that is the future of U.S. Navy unmanned aviation. 
The X-47B has been designed for use aboard Nimitz-class aircraft carriers. Its tailless batwing shape will make it the stealthiest unmanned system ever to take to the skies. Now, as a roboticist, I'm really impressed by this as a, as a really good piece of kit. It's fully autonomous, take off and land on its own from aircraft carriers, although planes have been pretty much doing that for a long time, but this has got no pilot on board. And the thing is, it's got a thousand mile reach, as, as George pointed out, which is ten times the reach of the F-25s that are currently on aircraft carriers. And one of the reasons for this is to deploy to the Pacific because now the Chinese have got aircraft carrier busting missiles that can actually sink a US aircraft carrier for the first time in history. They're not invincible. So the idea is to take the aircraft carriers much further back and so you need much greater reach. That's one of the ideas. Now this is just a prototype. Uh, it's got weapons bays, but it hasn't been tested with firing weapons. Now, a very similar one, these are going on all over the place. A very similar one is from the UK, made by BAE Systems. And, and that's been tested in Australia this year. And it's been tested going out over an area and acquiring its own targets. Okay. Other than that, we have a DARPA program going on here, which is in phase two of testing, which is a submarine hunting submarine. So it looks for diesel engines underwater and then sinks that submarine if it finds it. You know, it could be used for, uh, if there was a sort of very big war, it could be used for sinking diesel engine uh, ships as well. This is the Guardian which is an Israeli uh, robot, was, was touted at the beginning as being fully autonomous uh, and uh, with an kill, autonomous kill function. It is being used autonomously to patrol the borders, but now they say that the weapon is under remote control by people. One of the big troubles we have in, in running a campaign is as soon as you start a campaign, suddenly uh, you won't find that picture anymore. You won't find pictures of robots with weapons on anymore. They've all vanished suddenly. Uh, but I, um, by you know, good fortune, I happened to keep the pictures from, from two years ago. This is the, uh, you showed this, um, I'm 0.5 times heavier than you, um, George. This is the Crusher, which came out of the DARPA Grand Challenge, a wonderful Grand Challenge. You got the Google car coming out of one side and the Crusher coming out of the other. Cost 80 million to build Carnegie Mellon. Uh, fully autonomous capability, and there's a weapon on board there, but, the, but you don't see those pictures anymore either. The Airman teamed up with the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, to create the Crusher. It can drive itself. This is quite an extraordinary machine, really. It's, it's very powerful. Now, the ones that George showed you, the little uh, robots like the, you showed them the Mars, which looks like a big tank in your photo, but it's actually a bit, that, right, right, right. it's about that size. Now, they, they were problematic, of course, because when the mud dries on their tracks, they can't move. There's a lot of problems with ground robots, but this overcomes a lot of them. It can drive on a really steep slope, etc. But I'm showing you these to show you what the intention is for the future, what the sort of capabilities are. Okay, now let me go on to a little bit of international humanitarian law, which you might not be too familiar with here. That's the laws of war, Geneva Convention, all that kind of thing. That's IHL. The other, the other branch of law that we're concerned about, but I won't talk about today, is uh, international human rights law. That's another one we're very concerned about, this, this sort of technology moving into the civil world as well. But I can answer questions on that later. Now, human rights law... Essential, international humanitarian law, essentially, I've shown here is a tug of war between the humanitarians and the necessitarians. Now I'm a humanitarian, and at the very, very extreme end of humanitarians, you get pacifists. Necess so the, the idea of a humanitarian, generally, is that you don't want civilians being killed in warfare. I mean, I don't want anybody being killed, but, but in warfare, we don't want civilians being killed. The necessitarians, on the other hand, they're not after civilians, but you do what's necessary to win the battle. And the extreme end, that's anything. So you might bomb a city with, like you did in the uh, Second World War, where the United States and the uh, British 
bombed a city in France, saint Lô, to get a panzer div division, killing 11,000 French citizens. So that's military necessity. That's the other extreme. Now, international humanitarian law essentially is a compromise between these two camps. It's trying to find a way of compromising. Now, people say that I shouldn't really show it as a, well, the necessitarians say I shouldn't show it as a tug of war because there's a lot of grey areas, but I don't care. Uh, I'm showing it as a tug of war anyway. Um, so, so that tug of war goes on, and you, so you get the international humanitarian law. And I'm just going to go over some of that and what it's got to do with robotics. So we're looking here at the adequacy of these robot systems for international humanitarian law. And these are the main parts I want to look at. The cornerstone of international humanitarian law is the principle of distinction. The principle, of, and I'm going to paraphrase these because I'm not going to go into the long, uh, long form of them. Principle of distinction essentially says that you must not uh, kill civilians. It doesn't say you must not kill civilians. It says any weapon uh, must be aimed such that it will not kill civilians, uh, only kill military targets and military personnel. And that includes uh, others who are hors de combat, such as wounded soldiers, someone trying to surrender. Surrender gesture is not this, by the way. It's any gesture you wish to make, like, ah, oh, that, that will do. Uh, you mustn't kill wounded soldiers or chaplains, those kind of people. So, you, so a weapon that's used, must be able to, you must be able to make that distinction with it. Uh, you must be able to discriminate between a civilian object and the military object. Now, the principle of proportionality is a kind of fudge around this. Uh, and it started off with St. Augustine's principle of double effect, which was a bit different. Because his idea, St. Augustine's idea back in the 12th century, was that um, if you kill people by accident and you don't intend to kill them, then, you know, that's justified. But the principle of proportionality, as specified now in the laws of war, is slightly different. Essentially, what that says now is, you can kill civilians and destroy civilian objects, providing that it's directly proportional to military advantage. Now, let me just say that no one knows exactly what military advantage is. It's not objective. It's not an objective function. You can't quantify it. It's up to an experienced commander to decide. I can't say, for instance, that Osama bin Laden was worth 35 old ladies, 10 people in the wheelchair, 12 children. There's no objective function here. That's not how proportionality works. Um, there's also the precautionary principle and doubt. Precautionary principle, there's two types of precautionary principle. One is that you make sure that the target is legitimate. So if you're on the way to a mission and it turns out that you know, you're going to bomb a bridge because there's tanks going across it, you get there and now there's uh, only civilian cars going across it, the tanks have gone, that's no longer a legitimate target. And if in doubt, it's a civilian. That's the, that's the laws of war. Uh, George, you've co covered accountability, so I won't go on about that anymore. And I think Rob, if Rob's here, he'll probably cover that a bit. Um, he wrote the first paper on that. So let's look at that from the technological point of view. Well, where are we with the principle of distinction? Well, essentially, as far as autonomous robots are concerned, nowhere. Um, we've got a t automatic target recognition, that's got auditory uh, detection. So this is the Red Isle Sniper Detector, which has been around for about seven or eight years now. And what it does is it um, uses the sound, speed of sound between two microphones, and then if a sniper fires, it can rotate instantly and pinpoint that sniper. Now why has it not been used at all? Well, it has real problems, one with ricochet, so it has no idea if there's a ricochet where that was. If one of your own forces fires a weapon, it'll point at them and spread laser at them. All it does at the moment is it puts laser on the thing and then you can designate a, a munition towards that laser. So people have talked about using robots in very limp, because you can't conform to the principle of distinction, but maybe you could use them in very, very narrow, restricted circumstances like detecting a sniper, which is hard, uh, and firing straight at them. But it turns out that snipers are probably the most intelligent people on the battlefield. You're not going to fool them for very long. You might kill a couple of them, but after that, they're going to be on to the game. So if you set off a firework, for instance, in a crowded area, this would just fire ammunition into a crowded area. You can game the technology, in other words, quite easily. 
The other thing wrong with this is it's not something that can discriminate. It, doesn't, it can discriminate a bit, but it doesn't conform to the principle of distinction simply because if someone, if a shepherd, for instance, is shooting a wolf because it attacked his sheep, this would kill him. Okay? It's not conforming to the principle of distinction. I'm trying to make this clear, the difference between discrimination and distinction. Here's another one that's pretty widely spread. Uh, it's a radiation detection system. The US used to use these in the Vietnam War, something called the Shrike, and they've stopped using them now. This is produced by the Israeli aeronautical industries, and it's sold around the world, Turkey, Korea, China, Indian armies. It's called the Harpy. And what it does, it's a loitering munition, so it's rocket fired. I'll show you a, a, more new, a newer version of it called the Harpy. What this generally does, this is an odd use of it, what this generally does is before you go into war you want to take out the uh, anti-aircraft batteries before you do an air, air attack. So what you do is you send these into the air, they're loitering munitions and they fly around on their own looking, uh, trying to detect radar signals. As soon as they detect a radar signal, signal they look up the signature on a database and if that signature is not on the database they know it's a hostile signature so it just dive bombs it okay now the assumption uh, so that's that's not there's been no accidents with that I must say that I've heard reported so I, I can't really complain about it too much but it does not conform to the principle of distinction although it's very discriminating and it doesn't conform to the principle of distinction simply because if you took that the assumption here is that the radar is connected to an anti-aircraft weapon if you took the radar off the anti-aircraft weapon, it wouldn't know that. If you put that radar on a hospital roof, it would bomb the hospital roof. If you put it on a school, it would go through to the school as well and, and bomb it. Now, the argument here from Israeli people that you discuss it with is that it's, it, the responsibility is really on those who took the radar off and put it on the hospital roof. I mean, I think there's a shared responsibility. But anyway, the point is that it doesn't conform to the principle of distinction that it's being used. Now, a more serious problem for me, I mean, you know, we're getting better at robotics and maybe in 50 years we'll have better kind of dis distinction, discrimination, but when you start getting down to the level of when you're working in insurgent warfare and you're trying to tell the difference between a child with a stick and a soldier, it's, going to, it's, it's impossible at the minute, but that will get better over time. It still requires some level of human reasoning, though, in the fog of war. But look at this. Computer systems can't be proportionate, I would say. Now, now, there's two parts to this. Now, Ron Arkin, who was here yesterday, unfortunately didn't come today, I had breakfast with him this morning, has argued that we can do proportionality. I think he might have changed now because uh, most of the military lawyers and the JAG officers are all saying as well that this would be, they can't see this being done really. How do you do proportionality? Because there's two parts to this. And this is what some people get mixed up with. There's the easy proportionality problem and it's not easy. Now remember what proportionality is. The, uh, you can kill civilians providing it's directly proportional to military advantage. Okay. So the easy proportionality problem, as I say, it's not that easy, but I'm calling it the easy one because it's easier than the hard one. The easy proportionality problem is working out which is the best weapon to use to minimize collateral damage. Now, there's various bits of software that the US are using, such as bug splat, horrible name, and vast. And what that does is you, it's got a th if you ha it has a 3D map of the environment, you mark the target on there, and what it will do is it'll look at your arsenal, it'll pick the best weapon in your arsenal and the angle to fire at to minimize collateral damage. Okay. So it will get the least. Now I call that the easy proportionality problem because although it's minimizing collateral damage, uh, it's not doing the whole task. So supposing this target, for instance, is a lowly Al-Qaeda operative, just, you know, a, a dog's body, and he's, a, he's beside a school with a thousand children in it. Now, if you don't use this piece of software, you might kill a thousand children. If you do use it, you might only kill a hundred. 
Now the big problem, the hard problem, is deciding whether or not to do the strike in the first place. Making that balanced decision between those 100 children and that target. Making the decision, if, I've, if I kill this target, forget about the children now, if I kill this target, will it piss off the local villagers and they're not going to help us in our, our missions from now on? So that's a very difficult decision. Humans get it wrong sometimes. Um, but nonetheless they can be held accountable and also it's something that an experienced commander has to make in the field. I, I wish it was a bit um, more careful than it is actually from what I've seen and you need situational awareness for that. So it's really a subjective decision and I can't imagine a machine making that in the future and don't talk to me about uh, game playing things like Jeopardy please or Watson, different thing. Okay. Now on top of that uh, the Department of Defence uh, issued a directive in 2012 and it was the first policy statement made by any country about autonomous weapons and they say there that they're going to keep a human in the judgment loop now um, for the foreseeable future and this directive lasts for five years and it can be extended till ten. We must question what, uh, they're going to keep somebody there for appropriate judgment, levels of judgment and of course that could be no judgment. Okay, appropriate levels, so we have to be a bit careful with that. But what they do is they talk about uh, using, um, if you're all computer scientists you'll see why I'm a bit disturbed by this, but they're talking about using verification and testing methods to minimise <coughs> computer problems. Okay, uh, And they say this about, I don't know, about 14 times, 12 times in the document, and it's when you go to page 14 right down at the bottom in the glossary you'll see what the possible failures are. Um, human error, this, these are the things that we're going to minimise. Human machine interaction failures, malfunctions, communication degradations, software coding errors, enemy cyber attacks, it's getting more ridiculous to minimise, infiltration into the industrial supply chain, you can't use verification and testing techniques for that. Uh, jamming, spoofing and decoys and this one how are you going to minimize unanticipated unanticipated situations in the battlefield since you don't know what they are okay now, if you're computer scientists as we have in my department we have 30 people working in verification and testing a really biggest group in europe and they've been working on that now for about 30 years and you can, ver you can formally verify you know, fairly small programs, but not much. So really it needs empirical testing of this. And you all know te empirical testing of an autonomous weapon in a completely open-ended situation is going to be damn difficult, if not impossible at the moment. Okay. So what you've got is Article 36 is a way of reviewing weapons. I'm not going to go through all that. Um, it's every, state parties are under an obligation to determine whether the employment would in some or all circumstances be, be prohibited. Now, not every nation has signed up to Article 36, but a lot of them carry out weapons reviews. Now, the big worry is that will small states be able to carry out adequate weapons reviews? It's okay for the United States, a high-tech country, to do it. And I think their weapons reviews with these are going to be really, really difficult. Uh, never mind a small state. So that's that's a problem. Okay, so a first conclusion here. Um, I, international humanitarian law compliance cannot be guaranteed for the foreseeable future. Um, this is a conclusion that the International Committee of the Red Cross came to after a large uh, assessment with uh, technical people. They brought in a lot of technical experts and, and did an assessment. The predictability to perform mission requirements cannot be guaranteed. The unpredictability in unanticipated circumstances makes weapons reviews extremely difficult or even impossible to guarantee. IHL compliance. Okay. So, international security issues. Uh, as Robert E. Lee said after the battles of Frederick, Fredericksburg, it's well that war is so terrible or we grow too fond of it. And I think George pointed this out already, talking about um, lowering the threshold for warfare. That's one of the big issues. I won't go on about this too long. So we could get a reduction in threshold for conflict. I have no evidence for that, but it seems quite likely. One of the big things that stopped the Vietnam War, war was the body bags coming home. In fact, there's a really cynical thing in the United States called the Dover Test. 
in, it's talked about in Washington or on the hill, as they say. And what the Dover test is, is you, you get all these photographs of you know, coffins with American flags draped on it. And the Dover, as they come into Dover Airport, and the Dover test is how much did that affect your political chances in the next election? Okay, so that's the Dover test. So I don't want to see young men being killed at warfare. This could hold back uh, some of the people being killed, although uh, non-autonomous remote controlled weapons can do the same thing, but at the same time the threat of body bags can reduce the threshold for conflict. Also we can get unintentional triggering of conflict. We've already seen this in Iran when uh, United States drones have been flying onto the borders of Iran. The Iranians bring up jets immediately and uh, uh, launch them against the drones. But now every drone that goes near the Iranian border, every US drone, is accompanied by two fighter jets. That's really cost efficient. That's, that's ridiculous. Um, so Obama himself talked about the unintentional triggering of conflict with drones, never mind autonomous weapons. Another one is this, and you touched on this as well, is the accelerating pace of battle. Now, obviously, there are autonomous weapons out there already. And these are on been most American naval ships, British naval ships, European ones, Chinese ships, things like the Phalanx or the Sea Ram, which is a, a you know for anti anti mortar weapons, anti munitions, anti missiles, all for anti material. So in other words, they're against military objects. You have them in ships pointing up in the air in case they get swarmed. Okay, so you switch on the phalanx system in the case we think there's going to be swarm of uh, attacks against you coming in too fast and it will shoot them down. You've all heard of the Iron Dome which shoots down missiles in Israel. Uh, there's the, also the Patriot system that was used in the first Gulf War, shoots down missiles very quickly. We're not going to get those banned. Um, we have to find a way around that. But they only, they're only used against material objects. So this accelerating pace of battle is feeding on itself so that you get the sort of arms race, a speed race going on. Now the X-47B there is fast subsonic, just beneath the speed of sound. Uh, this one is the Anjin Invisible Sword from China. Been working on it for about seven years now. Um, and that's for air-to-air -air combat. Uh, it's uh, supersonic air-to-air -air combat. Now DARPA again, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, the uh, research wing of the Pentagon, has been working on this thing called the, the HTV-2 program. Um, and this is called the Falcon, and that's been tested at Mach 22, which is approximately 13,000 miles an hour, or if you're European, 20,000 kilometers an hour. So we're getting, we're getting faster and faster. Seven minutes, I thought. I timed it myself. Um, okay. Okay, so the next problem is, so we've got the speed of battle. The other problem is proliferation. Um, this is an Iranian, Reaper, as it were, copy of the US one. Now, as I say, I've tracked 85 countries that have now got military robotics programs, and I believe there are probably more than that. There are quite a few countries developing autonomous weapons, as I've told you, and I, I advise NATO, and I keep hearing things that I shouldn't hear because they forget that I don't have security clearance, and so I know about other things, and I don't have security clearance, and I could say what they are, but I'm not going to say it publicly because I like working with these guys because it's, it helps to be on the inside. Okay, but a number of countries are developing autonomous weapon systems that I know of quite seriously. Um, this one here is the, the um, Sentinel. <laughs> I've been, I read the defense news every morning. The Sentinel is one of those, the best piece of technology, stealth technology on the planet a US Sentinel drone. I'd never seen a picture of it before in my life until this one came on YouTube uh, when the Iranians captured one. And now I've seen one on a Japanese Air Force base here, a copy of it. So this stuff's getting around very quickly. Non-state actors will use it as well. It's, as you all know, any of us here, well, if you're a roboticist like me, you could build a killer robot tomorrow. A couple of heat sensors, swing it around. We have students who make, uh, paintball gun robots that fire paintball bullets at their friends and machine gun them as they run, try to get away. So, so they're not hard to make. The only point is how discriminating they are. The other problem, and I'm going through this quickly now, is the interaction of complex algorithms. 
So everybody's thinking blinkered terms, I have this weapon, you know, it's going to give me great military advantage and military domination, never mind other countries having it, when everybody has it and people are not talking about using singular robots, they always talk about swarms in the wrong way, they mean teams, uh, but they talk about interaction. When you think about this, how are you going to know if the other person hasn't revealed the combat algorithms, how unpredictable is that going to get? Okay. There's also a moral case against this mainly made by other people. Uh, the decision to kill should not be delegated to a machine. Uh, being killed by a machine is the ultimate human indignity. That's General Latif. And Peter Asaro from the International Committee from Robot Arms Control written a really good paper on this for the International Review of the Red Cross. Decision to kill is also a decision to override a human right, not only a moral to do so, etc., etc. You can see that. So. I'm just rushing now because I want to get this last little bit. What can you do about this? Well, uh, we started a committee in 2009. Uh, Rob Sparrow, who's here, and myself, he's from Australia, myself from the UK, Peter Asaro from the US, and Jürgen Altman, a physicist from Germany, and we started the International Committee for Robot Arms Control. There are 26 of us now, all academics, really. We've got legal people, roboticists, uh, you know, international relations, philosophers uh, dealing with ethics. So we started in 2009 and our mission statement was to get international discussion about these weapons and international discussion about prohibiting them. We weren't calling for a prohibition at that time, we were simply calling for international discussion. And we all wrote papers about it, went out and gave lots of talks, did all these uh, things. And we, you know, I, I certainly talk a lot to the military and the political sphere, but I don't know how to close the deal. That's the problem. I'm not a good salesman. So in 2012, we had a meeting in New York after I had talked to Human Rights Watch and helped them with a the report. We had a meeting in New York, and uh, this was a group of us in 2012, a celebration of landmines. And we got into bed, as it were, with a group of people who had got cluster munitions banned, they got landmines banned, they got blinding lasers banned. Uh, so Human Rights Watch, uh, Pax, Pax Christie, um, Harvard Law School, Article 36, uh, Judy Williams, who's a Nobel laureate, uh, has the Women's Nobel Initiative, Women's Initiative, uh, myself, uh, Jan Ambassador Jantha, who's another Nobel laureate with the, uh, what's it called, the Einstein Group, it's called, um, I've forgotten now, just Pugwash. Uh, human Rights Watch again. So the group of us got together and had a discussion about the idea of getting together a ban. And what we did is we started a campaign which was launched from the UK Parliament in April 2013. Okay, that's, that's the group there. We're not campaigners in the sense that we don't go around with banners. This is just a photo opportunity, okay? We're political campaigners. Uh, and that's how it's become now. So after that launch, in May that year, uh, Christoph Haynes, who's Special Rapporteur for the UN on extrajudicial killings, and we met him as well and had advisory sessions, and he released a report calling for a moratorium on lethal autonomous robots to the UN Human Rights Council. Okay. So that went on then. So one of the things we wanted to do was to get a complete prohibition on the kill function. Now, there's a committee of the UN called the CCW, the Convention on Prohibitions of Restrictions on Certain <coughs> Conventional Weapons, blah, blah, blah. You can see it there. Uh, CCW is easier to say. So they, they, they're the people who ban explosive remnants of war, landmines, chemical weapons, biological weapons, those things. And they have five protocols. And uh, we would like protocol six, possibly. I mean, it's supposed to be not very easy to get through. It took the landmine people with all their photographs of people maimed, maimed and sort of injured five years to get the CCW to even look at it, okay? Well, it took us, with, the, with our group of campaigners, there are 50 plus NGOs from 24 countries now, all campaigning their governments, uh, lobbying their governments, and it took us six months to get the CCW to look at it. So in, in May this year, uh, they, they had the first expert meeting uh, to see what people, what nations thought. So we went before them, and myself and Peter Asaro from the International Committee of Robot Arms Control gave talks there to 450 delegates from 87 countries. Now, getting it through the CCW was extremely difficult because I'm just, this is my last uh, slide, by the way. 
was extremely difficult because there are 147 nations to get through when we put it to them um, and any one of those 147 nations can veto it but we were lucky we had the presidency on our side which was France and we had the US on our side to get it in as well so that helped a lot and we got it through so we had the meeting it was very positive uh, 50 countries gave speeches about this all of them saying this was an urgent matter that needed to be considered and uh, five of them actually asking for an outright ban immediately including the Holy See which is the Vatican now what we wanted at that meeting our only our only uh, the goal of that meeting was simply to get this onto the agenda of the CCW and again the 147 nations will meet in November so we don't know the outcome of that there will be a report to them but it looks extremely positive at the moment and that will result in a GGE which is a group of governmental experts meeting for two or three weeks who will discuss it and then it will get on the agenda and that will be reviewed in 2015. It's likely to take two or three years but this is a step towards getting this, these weapons prohibited. It is possible, it's not inevitable. They can do it, they can actually put a prohibition together. Verifying it and stuff is another matter but they can actually prohibit it. So. Thank you very much for listening. I'll stop there. I won't tunnel any deeper. I'm sorry, I ran over by two minutes there. So, so now we can take questions from the audience. I have a question. Um, I wonder if you could... Uh, could you speak a bit louder? Because I'm not... Sorry. I wonder if you could say something about how you got started with this work and how if if it is at all, how it's integrated with your own scholarship, um, and, well, Sure. Um, well, I, I've never been a campaigner in my life. Uh, I'm now a full-time advocate, um, but I've never been a campaigner in my life before, and I, I never wanted to be a campaigner. I mean, I just was a standard academic with my head down, running a robotics lab, doing a lot of robotics research. Uh, but a lot of my robotics research was doing big uh, museum exhibits and that kind of thing, so I always had a lot to do with the media. And at one press conference, some journalists asked me about military robotics, um, and all I knew about was a little bit about bomb disposal and nothing else. So I went off to have a quick look at the internet for an evening, maybe a couple of hours, so that I could answer the next question. And I started looking through military robotics. That was about 2006. and. Uh, I ended up spending seven months doing that evening's work, uh, being completely shocked and horrified by the plans I was reading for robotics. And it was really science fiction. It was written by policymakers and other people who seemed to have no idea what the limitations of robotics was. And so the kind of, I mean, now the plans are getting much more realistic because since we started the campaign, they're actually bringing military engineers out of the woodwork and asking them. But um, that's how I got started and that's how it fit in with my scholarship. So I started thinking about it, um, you know, how can we possibly be doing this? And I talked to some journalists and I wrote a feature for one of our national newspapers, The Guardian, and in 2007 early. And after that, I was asked by the military to come and talk. I've talked to the military from about 28 countries now, probably more now, but uh, in the first couple of years, and, and just get lured into it. And there weren't a lot of roboticists in it at all, if, if any. Uh, working on this so I got kind of trapped and I felt too responsible and I couldn't get back out of it again so I got stuck in it and uh, eventually my other research went by the by the wayside and I stopped applying for funding and started working this full time to answer your question okay. I think people are probably desperate for coffee here I don't know why I am yeah so but maybe no. we're going to take the last question and then uh, we're going to go for coffee break until uh, 1050. Uh, so, and then we're going to have a, a series of uh, shorter uh, talks, and then after that, we're going to have a full uh, panel discussion. So, you, you will also have opportunity to ask questions uh, at that time. So, next question for the session. Thank you. Am I on the panel, by the way? I don't know if what's. You are. Because you didn't say. Well, there seem to be six people in the first panel and two in the second panel. Yeah, so all the people <laughs> Sorry. Come. So maybe this will be addressing the panel, but again, it's almost the same question. Could you speak a bit louder for me? Yes. Um, you, the, uh, one of the first slides you presented was a system where a computer is linked to a weapon and 
you said this is what you want to ban. It's uh, the link to the actuator, which is the web. Uh, so it's it's the same question. We do have this already. I mean, any uh, uh, infrared missile is working this way. Uh, so I think as geologists, we have the responsibility to, to be very clear on what we mean by a killer robot or a robotics lethal system. And it seems to me that uh, we have a lot of confusion still going on where robot systems start, where they finish. So my suggestion is that as a community, we should discuss this a little bit more thoroughly to really draw a line. It, it will be a gray line anyway, but at least a line where uh, we separate those two issues. Uh, Yes, I agree absolutely. Um, you know, this. I, if I had another hour, I would have gone through that. <laughs> uh, this is when I said about tunneling into the detail. This is what we've been doing now for for some time. This is this is this is the next step after you start a campaign and you start engaging more more in more detail with the military advisors and the defense departments around the world. There are a number of these systems around, but they're at the moment all of them are directed at military objects. For instance, air-to-air -air missiles. You have great sensing there, over-horizon sensing. You can pretty much tell from a, from a, a fighter, a U.S. fighter jet, what a MiG is when you release the weapon. Uh, there's also the phalanx and those things, but we're we're kind of getting into the detail of those, and they don't need to be. They're actually you can define them separately from anti-personnel weapons quite clearly. Um, but some of these, obviously, if there's personnel on a fighter jet, but it is a military object that's, that's armed. But I, I can't get into all the detail of that just now. But there, you're right that that's the, kind of, that's the kind of work we're doing now. And that's the sort of work uh, that a lot of our papers are about nowadays. Okay, so uh, thank you. Thank you, Jim.